Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at earsports.com, part of the CBS Sports Podcast Network. I am Mike Casaza here to help preview West Virginia's Saturday game, 3 p.m. FS1, on the road against Texas Tech. It's homecoming for the Red Raiders. It's homecoming for Chris Anderson. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome in. How are you? I am doing much better. I enjoyed my time off. Enjoyed a few days out in the mountains in Colorado. Uh, went to a place called the the Yampa Vapor Caves. Have you ever heard of this kind of thing? Apparently, I saw that in a Cheech and Chong movie. <laughs> yeah, well, might as well have been. Yeah, it's like a, a all natural, I guess, kind of a sauna thing, steam bath, whatever. It, you, you go down into the caves, and it's a geothermal. You walk down about 20 feet under this building, and all of a sudden you're just in the caves of a mountain, into the side of a mountain, and it's 115 degrees. And it's just supposed to – it's been around for 100, 200 years. Um, I think this one was like 1890 is the one I went into. And it was like places where uh, they advertise it as, hey, this is where Doc Holliday went to cure his tuberculosis. And all I kept thinking was it didn't – he didn't cure his tuberculosis. He just came here and died. So I don't know if that's much of a, much of a, um, you know, an endorsement there, but it, it was enjoyable. So I did have a good time. What's up with you and snakes? <laughs> I don't know, but my wife's losing her mind. Like I saw that little thing and I was like, Oh, it's a little baby garter snake. And my wife was like, it's in my coffee cup. Oh my God. I was like, that's yeah, fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I become a Red Bull guy at that point, I think. <laughs> Just I'm not going to take my chances anymore. Well, hey, despite all that, you came back, so good to know. And we have on tap this weekend a game that we circled at the very start. I went back and I listened to our prediction podcast, which, by the way, we're only one game off. That's true. Um, we knew this one was going to be important. Things that we wrote about before that, what we said during that podcast – this kind of felt like one they had to have if they were going to be a bowl eligible. And that's more true now than it was then. There's a lot lined up in this game that just is kind of worth quickly mentioning. For example, Neil Brown has not beaten Texas Tech. This is the third time that Brown has played Texas Tech where the Red Raiders are coming off of a bye. Excuse me, an open week. Man, 20 push-ups for me. He's only been the coach four years. But he's got three open week teams from Texas Tech coming at him. And did he seem perturbed by that during the uh, media? I, 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 one of those things I think he was glad someone said. <laughs> like I noticed that I was like, oh, that's not worth the question, but I'm glad that whoever was asked because he, he did seem like it was upsetting. Also, the 11th time that they played, this would be the sixth time, I believe, at Texas Tech, correct? It's the mm-hmm. fourth time that West Virginia has been the homecoming game. It's not like high school where you schedule a win, but like, I don't know, like that's, you can certainly pick your homecoming game, and I wonder if that bugs a team, too, because like I'm sure a lot of these players who were just in high school or not that long ago remember winning like 72-10 to 10 on their homecoming game because you scheduled a win, and here you are going, wait a minute, we're the homecoming game again for Texas Tech? And this is the one team that West Virginia plays that has a decided time advantage of preparation, which we can get into why that may matter because Texas Tech's offense is kind of tricky, but um, a lot of quirks that line up in this game, and oh, by the way, it's a game that they really probably – need to win and i don't know you can look at it in some ways and say that they perhaps have some advantages and maybe they should win yeah absolutely you look at, at this game and the rest of the schedule and you and i were talking about it right before we hopped on here is this the most winnable game remaining on the schedule um you threw out another option in iowa state good pick this one it could be if it's not the easiest the second easiest or not easiest but most winnable again um big 12 stuff this year it, it it's top to bottom probably the deepest conference in the country. And there are no off weeks. There are no gimme games. Uh, you know, obviously Kansas is not Kansas anymore. Um, they're a team that's going to give a lot of other programs trouble. Uh, and, and there is no kind of, you know, eighth or ninth team where you're like, yeah, that's probably a win as well. And, and if anything, Texas Tech and Iowa State are kind of in that group of, hey, these are games that – you know, you might need to rely on as a win or you might need to win in order to be bowl eligible. Deep conference, best in America, no days off. Chris, I turned my head for a second because I saw that the 
prime minister of the UK resigned. I thought you were talking about basketball for a second. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. Like similar to football or basketball, someone's got to be ninth place in this league, and it's it's going to be a race to out of the bottom here. And I don't know, like this this didn't seem like the fate awaiting Texas Tech, but they've come back to really quite a bit. West Virginia, it seemed like perhaps the fate awaiting the Mountaineers, but they've risen up lately, and they'll have to do some things well, obviously that they've done well in their wins and avoid some of their pitfalls and their losses. But those are things that are going to be certainly front and center against Texas Tech, which is a bizarre little team here that's kind of fun with a coach that, again, this seemed like the happiest place in college football for a while because everybody liked their head coach now. I'm not sure the previous guy was too popular, but even in the industry, everybody liked their head coach. Got some transfers that came in, seemed like they made it a good place, and then the schedule started. Uh, FCS team. Five straight ranked opponents, West Virginia. They're three and three. They're one and two in the Big 12. This will be the first time in a long time they have played a team that does not have a number next to its name. What have the Red Raiders been through so far? I, it's kind of remarkable to look into. And I asked uh, Jared Johnson of our Texas Tech site about that exact thing. I was like, that what? What? I think if you go through five straight top 25 opponents, including three of those games on the road, if you go two and three. I think that's okay. I mean, nobody wants to go two and three. Nobody wants to be a 500 team. But when you, if you can go two and three against top 25 opponents, you might be a pretty good team yourself. And, um, you you know, Jarrett over at our Texas Tech site inside the Red Raiders told me that was kind of the feeling around Lubbock was nobody likes that. Nobody wants to be two and three. Nobody wants to take those three losses. And a couple of them stung because they had opportunities there to, to win maybe one or two other one of those games. But they also had opportunities to lose one or both of the games that they ended up winning. So fans are okay, maybe even slightly pleased with how things are going. And I think, honestly, you know, if you told me West Virginia was going to play five more ranked opponents, which they might, do they? Or they pay, no, three more after this. They had two before. But Oklahoma was one of them, and they're not ranked. Right. Um so, you know, if you said two and three against ranked opponents, I think that's really not that bad. And and that's something to remember. We, they're not your typical three and three team. But then again, maybe West Virginia isn't either. Hmm. hmm. Sets that sets something up here. Let's go to the schedule. Open Murray State, 63 to 10. Um, home against Houston, 33-20, double overtime. Crazy game. Go to NC State, lose 27-14 because Tony Gibson does not lose to Texas Tech. Home against Texas, they're down by 14 in the fourth quarter. They win 37-34 in overtime. At Kansas State, they kind of get strangled there, 37-28 loss. At Oklahoma State, new quarterback, plays okay, 41-31. It's 9 and 11 points their last two games. On the road against ranked teams, they have a big comeback against Texas. Bizarre finish where they sub out quarterbacks with like four minutes left against NC State, and then kind of a, a fun little early season game against Houston there. Good teams, good defenses there, too. Two of those teams aren't ranked anymore. Um, I don't know. Sometimes you look at the schedule early in the season and you'll mess with, like, versus FBS, not versus FBS, uh, winning records, home records, whatever, to see how stats actually rank when you kind of make the variables meaningful. I have no idea how to view their stats because they played so many good teams. And you're looking at things like, well, they're they're number X in the country, top 20 in this, top five in this. They lead the country in a couple of different weird stats. But did that against a really good schedule, too. I I feel like it could be a good team, but I could feel like the opposite may also be somewhat true in that they just haven't quite been up there. But as you said, been close to some games they lost, maybe lost some games they should have won. And here comes West Virginia, somewhat battle-tested. Does any of the past even matter, though, when it comes to this stuff here? Because not a lot of familiarity. One team's on a break, but one team's kind of surging right now. Does the first six mean anything right now to these two teams, or is it just basically the what have you done for me lately kind of thing? I think big picture it doesn't because so much of what Texas Tech has done, and you hit on this during the press conference and uh, about how their offense keeps changing. I mean, they're literally changing quarterbacks as well. Um, They... What uh, God was his name? Um, might be starting his second game for them. Baron Morton. Yeah, Baron Morton. Um, God, I, was about to, I was about to call him Morton. Uh, Baron Morton, uh, according to Jared Johnson again from our Texas Tech side, he is expected to start this game. 
uh, even though Donovan Smith will also be healthy. Um, the transfer from Oregon, who started the first game of the season, might also be back soon, but probably not this weekend. Uh, it's kind of up in the air, and they don't seem like I think the most fascinating thing to me about that is this quarterback situation. Again, I get it. The offense is changing. Different things are going on. They're playing tough teams. They're just switching gears, you know, midseason with quarterback. Just like, yep, you know what? Hey, let's switch over to Baron Morton. Let's go with him. Even though I know Donovan Smith is your guy, Mike. He's been your guy for a while. Yeah, yeah. And he I don't think he's been bad this year, but they seem content, at least according to what uh, Jared had told me, with switching over to Morton, who you look at his stats, he's got a lower completion percentage. Uh, as many interceptions as touchdowns, uh, a lower passer rating. And and Smith, I feel like, is a bit more of a runner, or at least that has that bigger body that can get you those short yardage games. But they just seem to be ready to switch on over and just switch back and forth between quarterbacks and maybe even play two of them at the same time. All right, let's not belabor the point anymore. Let's do our matchups here. We'll start with the Texas Tech offense. And why not begin with the quarterback? Because it's that obvious. They say both are going to play. Um, it sounds like all three guys are practicing or at least were in line of practice when they did their news conferences earlier in the week. But uh, the head coach, Joey McGuire, says you'll see two more than you have lately. So that certainly sounds like that. Morton and Smith will play. I I just can't get over the end of the NC State game where Smith, my guy, did not look very good. Um, seemed puzzled, didn't know what to do with the drops that Tony Gibson was throwing at him. And then, like, in a 27-14 game with several minutes left, they put Morton in cold. Makes it, makes it hard for me to say that with an open week, a guy who was healthy, healthier than he was when he passed for 379 yards against Oklahoma State, that you would not have him start the game. He seems like he's the future, the highest-rated 24-7 sports quarterback at Texas Tech. Think about that for a second. No good quarterbacks there. Grand 24-7 wasn't around, for example, Grand Harrell. But still, they've had some good passes come through there. I don't know how it wouldn't be Morton. Smith does give you a guy who can run a little bit, has taken a ton of sacks, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Morton just seems more like the gunslinger in the offense they want to do. So much so, they let him throw the ball 63 times on the road in his first start. Some of it he had to, but he also came out thrown quick, early, often had a touchdown on the first drive. Looks good. I, it just seems like he's their their present, if not their future as well. Yeah, I mean, it, a freshman here is who we're talking about. For those who don't know, a freshman, former four-star recruit, top 247 player. Um, yeah, that's that's a lot of passes in one game to, to your first true run. I mean, like you said, he played a handful of snaps against NC State, uh, played a handful of snaps in a game last year. I think that was a blowout, like just a couple. Um, Murray State, he got in in garbage time. But that in his first true run as a quarterback, like this is what do they call it in the basketball? A usage rate, a usage mm-hmm. rate where he had uh, I'm looking at uh, stats here, 62 pass attempts and 16 rushing attempts. That's a heck of a usage rate. Mike. I would love to have that kind of usage rate out on the field. You're a chucker, right? Shoot it. <laughs> just just keep shooting. Keep dribbling. Shoot, Don't worry about shoot it. First, shoot second. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be stunned if Shook plays. Smith probably is a short yardage, maybe red zone guy, but I would say, man, the most of the snaps should go to Morton, too. Um, running is something that Morton can do. Um, running for his life, maybe, is something that Morton should be able to do. This offensive line is, um, boy, I'm trying to be polite here. Problematic, troubled, sieve, bad? Where do we go with this? I don't know. I'll let you touch on the worst of the worst because you, because you beat me to the punch on that one, on the one, the, the biggest glaring um, hole in that offensive line. I think, you know, I did I did that Texas uh, video podcast and I said for he asked uh, Chip Brown asked me, what, what, is, what is Texas going to be looking for with West Virginia? I said there is going to be a big glowing neon sign on West Virginia secondary that Texas should attack. There is going to be a big glowing sign on one certain offensive lineman. Um, which you can talk about in a second for West Virginia to attack, but he's not the only one because according to PFF, these are the rankings, which is the worst, you know, so first is the worst uh, in pressures allowed. 
in the Big 12 Conference. Texas Tech's starting five rank first, third, fourth, seventh, and eighth. In a 10-team league, meaning there are at least 50 offensive linemen who have received starters-level snaps, their five rank in the top eight in pressures allowed. <laughs> and not only that, like it, it's 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 one thing if there is pressure, it is another thing if your quarterback can't handle pressure. Morton is what has so far small sample size. Again, noted it hasn't played that much. Uh, terrible under pressure. His Q, his NFL quarterback rating, his NFL passer rating drops from 95.6 when he is kept clean to 24.7 when he is under pressure. If they resort to Donovan Smith, he's got four interceptions to one touchdown when he's under pressure. And his NFL passer rating drops from 113.8 down to 31.3. So the offensive line can't block and the quarterbacks can't pass when they get pressed. So, Mike, it, please take the honors on on our what do we call it? L L V P, least yeah. valuable player on that offensive line. I, I hate to, I just hate to single a guy out, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why here. But one, quarterbacks are sometimes the issue. I was looking at the PFF stuff, and the quarterbacks are not credited with many sacks here. I think two or three. Um, Smith has 15 scrambles and nine throwaways. He's also made 10 turnover worthy throws. That's that's tricky. And again, I, I just I just wonder at what point you say, OK, good player has a niche for us. Also has to be behind our offensive line. and That's not what he's going to do. So that's that's certainly a problem. And I, I just I can't see him being the guy. The, the issue more so is that their left tackle is has just had a bad year. Um, again, I hate to single out. I just hate to because there's so much more that goes into it, which I can get into. But Caleb Rogers is their left tackle. Has allowed 13 sacks <laughs> this season. Chris, there are 63 out of 131 teams that have not yet recorded 13 sacks. There are 65 out of 131 teams that have not yet allowed 13 sacks. He has allowed 13. That is the number one total in the country. That would be the number one total at the end of the season every year, dating back to 2014, save one, when a player gave up 14 sacks. So he is on his way to some sort of a season here. When they played... Two very good rush ends at Houston and at Kansas State. Uh, Houston's Derek Parrish had four and a half sacks, six and a half TFLs against Texas Tech. Kansas State's Felix and Udike Uzoma, three sacks against the Red Raiders. Rodgers was credited with nine sacks in those two games against PFF by PFF. <laughs> that's that's tough and. Here's where things get, get tricky. He may not be a left tackle. He's playing left tackle for them. Um, they have an Oklahoma State transfer playing right tackle. They have a junior college transfer playing center. They have guys who are backups who have played for them before, and he's out there. Um, now, this is where things get a little, yeah, but. No one's played more snaps per game than him. Could that be why he struggles? Could that be why the offensive line struggles? Also, no one's played more snaps per game than Texas Tech, and no one's throwing the ball more per game than Texas Tech, which is all to say if you put him out there more than anybody, you pass the ball more than anybody, and you have more snaps than anybody, you're likely to take some damage. He's just taken a lot of damage this season. And we've seen West Virginia recently move Dante Stills around to end a whole lot, put him and Sean Martin together on edges. They played some even front. They've also kind of brought more and more pressure from Spear, from linebacker, from Will even. They've got to attack that edge on the left side Saturday afternoon. I don't know how they don't do that. I did ask Neil Brown and Jordan Leslie this in their news conferences. Actually, I asked Brown. Someone else picked up my question and asked Leslie first. But when you see something like that, Chris, can you ignore the giant neon arrow that points at him? Or does that get you too much out of your plan? Do you fall into their trap? Do you try to do something maybe you're not good at or maybe something that's too heavy and creates an imbalance about what you want to do defensively? It's a good question, I think. And their answer was, I don't know what their answer was, to be honest with you, but it just seemed to me like cat and canary, like, yeah, we're going to do that. I, I just, I don't know how they don't try to overwhelm the left side and left tackle here and see what happens. If it doesn't work early, get out of there. But if you can shake him up and you could get them going, oh, no, not again, 
it's Houston, it's Kansas State, it's Dante Stills, it's Sean Martin, it's, I don't know, Lee Koba. Um, I think that would be a really good worry to put in their ear early in the game. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't see how they don't either. And I think we've seen at least some, you know, changes to, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it the role of a couple guys, but we've seen Lee Koba get a little more active getting towards the quarterback the last couple games. We've seen Jasir Cox get in there a little bit. We saw Jarrett Bartlett in there a couple times this, this most recent game against Baylor, but that's the, I can't remember how you phrase it there, but it, this is the situation, the conundrum between uh, what Texas tech is not good at. They cannot pass block at all, but West Virginia isn't exactly some pass rushing specialist over here. Um, mm-hmm. The Mountaineers currently rank eighth out of the 10 teams in the Big 12 in pressures from their defensive linemen and their edge rushers. Uh, Dante Stills, I think, is uh, he's got 15. He's got double digits. And then you got to go all the way down to like Taj Alston, who's who's turned into more of a backup lately with seven and Sean Martin with eight or something like that. So you're you're talking about just a couple guys. And really, the only one that is in the top. 20, I think, in the entire league is Dante Stills. So are you going to scheme up your defense to have Stills lined up across Caleb Rogers every single play? Do you want to do that? Do you want to get out of because you are so good at stopping the run that you're going to sacrifice that in order to try to take advantage of, you know, exploit their weaknesses? I I don't know that. Hey, that's why I don't get paid millions of dollars to be a coach. Um, but that's going to be an interesting, interesting look from West Virginia, especially early, as you noted. Give it a shot early. See if it works. See if you can make pressure with what you have. If not, get back to what you do well. Well, you should make millions of dollars because if they don't do this, then they're leaving money on the table, I think. Um, at, this feels like a game where Linnell Carr and Jared Bartlett may do something of note. I, I, I can just see them getting wide and trying to rush around this guy and see if they can do something here. They're tight ends. They have two... Um, Last year, Mason Tharp was a good player. They brought in from Texas A&M. Here we go, tight ends, Chris. It seems like a theme. Baylor mm-hmm. Cup, um, good players, um, targets in the passing game. We'll see. But the other part of this, and this is kind of what I think that the Mountaineers are perhaps concerned about, um, maybe you've noticed West Virginia's secondary is, let me see if I could find the right word here, problematic, troubled, sib, bad, I don't know. Um, but I was looking at the PFF stuff on the average depth of target for Texas Tech. I mean, of their top guys who, you know, main receivers, targets, first downs, whatever, like two of them, three of them have like significant average depth of target, which means like that's where they're catching the ball on average and they're getting the ball thrown to them. But you're looking for guys who are like really important parts of the offense who their their ADOT is is pretty humble. 8.1, 4.6, 7.4, 7.1, which means that ball's coming out quick. And wouldn't you know it, they run a ton of screen passes, 52 from Smith and Morton, um, no one in the Big 12 outside of TCU has thrown more. It could be a lot of run and chase and tackle for the secondary, which isn't it. But like, I just, I just don't see it. Like, here's, here's the problem with like gassing up your car to rush the passer is that they may just be winging it sideways instead of vertically or doing really quick stuff. Then there's a draw, and there's a tight end, and there's a screen or something like that, and who knows what happens. But it's gonna be quite a chess match because I don't know how you don't try to rush the passer here. Which, yeah, are they great at it? No. They're not, but they have a player or some players who can do it. They have schemes that can exist to make it happen, and why wouldn't you give it a shot? The trouble is that, as Jordan Leslie said, when you do something like that, at the end of the play, someone's band is playing, and you hope it's yours. And we, we've heard a lot of the opponents' fight song this year, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, looking at the numbers, West Virginia's second worst, the 130th out of 131 teams in 20-plus yard pass plays allowed per game. They have allowed five per game so far this season. Only Arkansas, which has allowed 36 in seven, in seven games, so a little over five, is worse. Um, Texas Tech has uh, has 29, and you noted a couple guys have a long average depth of target, but the main guys do not. And I went back and looked game by game to see what they were doing with those long pass plays. Ten of them came in that Murray State game. So hmm. you're getting to a more realistic, a more, what would you say, humble um, uh, look at, at a, quote, deep passing game. Maybe that's not really a deep passing game with the Red Raiders, uh, like you said. But here's my follow-up to that, is that 
better for West Virginia? I mean, I, I guess it is because at least you have a chance, but West Virginia's secondary and their tackling has been um, troubled, problematic, tr- sieve. Yes, bags. I was trying to think of all the things you said there. Troubled, problematic, a sieve, because they, they, they have a really hard time tackling after the catch. They are one of the worst in the entire country in missed tackles after a catch. And that's problematic because it, what's the difference between a 25 yard pass play that's 25 yards in the air and a 25 yard pass play that's five yards in the air. I I guess in the end, it doesn't really matter, but tech can probably get something going with their short passing game. And we're going to have to see something from West Virginia secondary that we have not seen all season long. And that is good open field tackling. Hmm. Um, Texas tech 19 in the country in 15 yard pass plays or more. The average about 20 plays per game of 10 yards or more. So lots of chunk plays there. Hey, Chris, what do you think spent more time being reviewed as far as film goes? Was it the Baylor screen pass that went for a touchdown? Pretty bad play, right? Or was it the targeting call on Andrew Wilson Lamp that West Virginia sent to the Big 12 office to be reviewed? (laughs) I'm going to go on the screen pass uh, without much hesitation there. Yeah, that was that was a really bad one. I think that that screen pass, we're thinking about the same one because there have been so many short passes mm-hmm. that end up in long pass plays. Um, I think, our, if I recall correctly, three, four missed tackles on that one, including, um, was it Floyd at the end? Who kinda don't don't just, say his name. Yeah, it's, God, just, it's tough. <laughs> kind of just lightly tapped him and let him go. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's... I there's only so much you can say and do about that because that is something. And I think if you go back and listen to one of our preview pods, this was something you brought up and you said you were hearing this was a concern tackling in the secondary, that the offense was gashing plays during preseason. And a lot of it was because of a lack of tackling in the secondary. And here we are week eight coming up and it's been an issue all season long. To wrap it up with their run game here, two good running backs, Sir Roderick Thompson, Taj Brooks, seems like they've been around forever because they have been around forever. Uh, Thompson, no stranger to West Virginia in his career, has had some pretty good games against them, scored a bunch of touchdowns, um, two touchdowns last year on the ground against them, um, one touchdown the year before, combined 100 yards those two games. He's been around. He's done some good things. West Virginia thinks highly of him. Taj Brooks, another guy, good complimentary players. But their run blocking isn't very good either, which, again, kind of goes back to their their offensive line issues here, too. And they also pass the ball so much that a lot of their rushing stats are going to be skewed. But if you go on averages here, Thompson's 4.84, Brooks is 4.06. Brooks was their guy, four touchdowns, gotten some short yardage plays. Thompson, probably more of the every-down guy. 11 more carries, 95 more yards, so a bit more productive, too. But um, can't get beat on the run in this game here because I think if Texas Tech can settle in and run the ball and take away some of the the – risk i guess that comes with passing the ball or taking sacks then they'd be very happy to do that and while they can play high scoring games they don't have to i think they'd be pretty happy if they could be 50 50 or just at least at least get productive runs and control the clock and the ball and by the way keep west virginia's offense off the field yeah you go and look at these two running backs and you got brooks who was this guy who kind of came off the bench last year and was this change of pace big hitter type had some big runs Mm -hmm. averaged six and a half yards per carry down to 4.1 right now. Yeah. Um. You know he's 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 a big thick back, but he's he's just not getting the yardage, the chunk yardage that he did this past season. And then you go over to Thompson, and 4.8, solid. I mean, I think most people would take that from your running back. But again, where where's the big play? Where's the long play? Uh, he has a long this season, a long run of this season of 24 yards. Which, again, that's a nice run, but most running backs at this point of the season have a run longer than that, have multiple runs longer than that. And you go through and you look at Texas Tech's other running stats and their situations, their PFF grades for run blocking, which, again, that this takes out how much they pass, all this other stuff, and looks at just how well they are run blocking and creating holes. They rank 118th out of 131 teams. Ooh. That it, This is... This is the opposite of what we were saying before. This is a, a a weak, weak, weak point for Texas Tech and a very, very strong point for West Virginia because West Virginia is one of the better teams in the country in run defense. Meanwhile, you look at, at their average yards per rush, and this is skewed 
because again, college stats take into account sacks, sack yardage into rushing attempt into rushing <laughs> yardage of rushing attempts. Yeah. So yeah, well, Texas Tech ranks 114th uh, with just 3.28 yards per carry. Again, I don't know how much you can take into that into account with that because of all the sack yardage, but the run game should not be an issue in this game, at least as far as Texas Tech running the ball is concerned. I pray for Bob Hertz on this game because if Taj Austin tackles Taj Brooks and there's an incident on the field, that's T-A-I-J-H Austin versus T-A-H-J Brooks. I don't know how Hertz is going to handle that one. I just hope he's sitting back next to you uh, again this week. Was that, was that truly an imposter sitting next to you a couple weeks ago? That was Justin Jackson, which is probably the best imposter you can get, I think, in that situation. <laughs> he can do an able Bob Hertzl impression for sure, too. Um, I'll get you the sack totals in a second. I did have it written down, but, like, the numbers have cost Smith, like, over 125 yards rushing. Sure. Which happens when you get sacked 18 times, too. So yeah. that's going to be an issue here. Um, suddenly better running the ball. I shouldn't say suddenly because I guess it was from one game to the next, but West Virginia has run the ball with success this year. Uh, again, they're they're going to want to be about even and do 50-50 kind of stuff. Um, sounds like that C.J. Donaldson is on track to play. Just early whispers. I'm assuming that when Neil Brown comes to his news conference tonight on the radio, or I guess you call it his radio show, he'll have more updates on injured players. That would be the most notable one. Charles Woods as well. By the way, if they get Charles Woods back, their secondary is at least a little better arm for the receivers the slew of receivers will play on the texas tech side you're gonna see probably eight nine receivers for texas tech um here we are sitting in the conversation we forgot about charles woods completely chris but oh well um, donaldson's a big one i guess but mathos looked great last week johnson's very comfortable coming in and, and like you know pinch hitting in the seventh inning or or playing defense in the ninth inning he, he's just good in that role he seems like he's unaffected by being on the sideline um I don't know. It just seems like that their running game is okay right now. Their offensive line is fine. They're going to get a challenge in the defensive line. Another good defensive line with some pro um, players, some certainly some big bodies, but it's not going to be bigger or, or better or more pro potential laden than Texas and Baylor the last couple of weeks. I, I'm trying to think of a time in the Brown tenure where the offensive line has been as, um, I don't know, confidence inducing. It's not a worry right now. And it's been like that for, I mean, I would even say maybe going into the Texas game, probably what was most disappointing was that nothing happened, but they felt good about their offensive line there. They were interested to see how they could handle it. They kind of got tricked a little bit by an even, excuse me, an odd front and putting someone over their, their center, but their center played very well last week against Siaki Ika. You're going to get Jalen Hutchings. You're going to get Terrell Owens. You're going to get, I don't know, a, a quirky front here too, that again, we can get it how they, how they make it work. But, um, I guess we kind of just put aside the, oh, no, offensive line. That way of thinking now and just figure out, oh, offensive line, how are they going to make it work this week? And you can't blame me for thinking that way. Uh, It was just in Neil Brown's first year, that was the, two what, two yards per carry season Mm -hmm. where West Virginia ranked 129th out of 130 teams. Last year, they were one of the worst in the country in sacks allowed, I think 111th out of 130 teams, uh, or 131, I guess, last year. And this year, they're top 25 in both categories. Top 25. A top 25 offensive line. For And, and you know, in the offseason, you know, fans always are looking to improve a program and a coaching staff. And, and they are always discussing which coach is not living up to their billing for their position. And Matt Moore was always someone that – the fans would mention something that if they were to make a change, that was where they would make a change. And meanwhile, now you're looking at a team that he has built this, this offensive line room up from where it was added in a bunch of youth. Uh, They got their experience. Now they got some depth a little bit and they're top 25 in rushing attack and in protecting the quarterback. And I don't think you can ask much more of the team, although I'm with you. It didn't feel like it three weeks ago. Because I think, but again, we kept saying it. We said it in the post game. We said it again and again and again. Just because you're not as good as a team with multiple All Americans doesn't mean you suck. Mm-hmm. And that's what West Virginia's offensive line was facing. I mean, Pitt's Pitt's defensive line had an All American and another All Conference player on it. Um, at least two NFLers, maybe more in the future. Kansas has had the uh, transfer who 
might as well be all American by the time all everything's said and done. And then Texas is the best Big 12 pass rushing attack, or the by far the best Big 12 pass rushing attack. So it, it you're playing. They just played three of the toughest kind of edge pass rush. I mean, I know what Kansas isn't as a whole that good, but they had a couple good players, and mm. so it's it's a man. I almost said it's the West Virginia's offensive line is a strength. Mike, have I gone too far? What year is this? <laughs> like it's, I, it's 2027 or it's 2016. I'm not sure. <laughs> it, it I don't think it's that crazy to say it out loud. I it, it sounded funny coming out of my mouth there, but I I don't think that's wrong actually. I think it doesn't get enough credit for making life easier for JT Daniels too. Yeah. Um, we focus on the run game, but he's had really good pockets this year and gotten some help with some rollouts lately too, which I know that's your favorite, but they've also done some good things with the offensive line by keeping him in the pocket where he's able to do some good things too. So um, the front for Texas tech. Yeah. Good. Again, Hutchings, I mentioned six foot three ten, a senior. Uh, I definitely got the name wrong. I called him Tyree Owens. It's Tyree Wilson. I don't know why there's a Terrell Owens on the team somewhere. I think too. Maybe yeah, Tyree Ty- Owens used to be a West Virginia player too, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. Tyler Owens is a safety. Tyree Wilson is a legit pro prospect. I've seen him projected in the first round of some mock drafts already. Uh, 6'6", 275, big sack, big TFL guy, a, a physical specimen. Their inside's very interesting. Uh, Tony Bradford, a productive player for a while. Philip Liddy. Those are both like 300 pound guys in the middle. So they're going to be, they'll be hard to move, but again, nothing, nothing too unusual. They're veteran though. They had a lot of players come back. They have a number of transfers on their team, a number of super seniors. Their secondary was supposed to be a strength this season. And here's where I get stuck, Chris. We talked about their front. Um, We certainly remember the name Krishan Merriweather, their linebacker, Kosi Eldridge plays. I believe it's the will for them. Um, they, They get some action out of their outside linebackers, but mostly it's a front back defense, not unlike West Virginia, but I don't know what to make of their secondary. And I think that like West Virginia could come out just gunning on this. They have some guys who have really um, active. Let's say they play a lot of man. They'll match you up a little bit and, and, and match things with the patterns that you run and who's out there. But they do play man, which has not been West Virginia's strength. However, certainly a guy like Caden Prather feels better now than he did before. You have to think maybe Bryce Ford will be do I don't know, but they also have rolled in some different guys who can maybe make some things happen. But throw it out there, see what happens against man. We'll see. But they have guys who have gotten their hands on balls. They only have two interceptions, so they're in the area a lot, but they're not making plays. Um, sometimes it just being in the area is, is like a horseshoe hand grenade kind of thing is good enough, especially man to man. Not great tacklers. Some guys have given up high completion percentages. And West Virginia has come out throwing the ball before against some teams here, too, to maybe set up their run. Um, I'm curious where this goes, but I can certainly see them spreading things out a little bit. When you only got one tight end now, you can't do 12 personnel. Maybe you go a little bit lighter on 11 personnel. Um, if you only got two running backs in this one here and you're expecting to have to run the ball late or run the ball into big boxes, I don't know. It seems like they could perhaps be more likely to throw the ball or at least take some chances, take some risks, calculated risks early in this game against a secondary that – you, it may differ from one game to the next, but your offense may have a lot to do with what the outcome is for their secondary. Yeah, Texas Tech, I, you look at a lot of their stats, and and I was a bit confused, or you would be a bit confused if you didn't actually watch some of the games mm-hmm. because most of their statistics, you know, their, their average yards per play allowed, that kind of stuff on defense, their completion percentage allowed, it's – middle of the road like 50 out of 130 60 out of 130 like it's not bad it's not terrible then you look at their points per game and it's terrible like it's bad it's around 100 and you're like why what's going on how does this happen and the answer is pretty clear it's twofold one their offense turns the ball over and or goes for it a lot on fourth down setting up great field possession for the other team Um, and and West Virginia fans have seen this in, in years past where you know, the offense struggles or turns it over, and then the defense gets put in a bad spot. Um, I was at the, yeah, in their four power five games, sorry, I was pulling up my stats. They have had an average, the opposing team has had an average starting field possession position around the 40 yard line. Because <laughs> in large oh part <laughs> yeah, of turnovers and failed fourth downs. They are starting, have had 18 attempts. And now, well, 
18, and one of those was an interception for turn for a touchdown, which I counted as zero yards. So that might skew it. Just It only skewed the total about two yards or one yard. Um, but they've had 18 attempts where you are starting around midfield or closer for in four games. So more, almost four, more than four drives per game against power five opponents are starting around midfield and moving the, in the positive direction. That's why their defense gives up a lot of points. Uh, you know, obviously the closer you are to the end zone, the easier it is to score. And West Virginia is going to have to take advantage of that. And the flip side is their defense doesn't get any turnovers. You mentioned it only no. two interceptions all year. That is one of the worst in the country. They don't get a lot of fumbles. And I could not help but laugh hysterically when I was speaking with Jarrett from our Texas Tech site. And he said, man, this defense just cannot get turnovers. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's this, it's that. And they are tied with West Virginia with six. And West Virginia got three in the last game just to get to six. So, I said, hey, I think I know what you're talking about. I think I have a pretty good idea of what you're talking yeah. about. Both teams have only... Uh, have only gained six turnovers so far this season. So I noticed this when I watched the game, and it, it stu- stood out to me, and I remembered it this week, but when Texas Tech played NC State, um, Malik Dunlap is one of their corners. By the way, their corners, Malik Dunlap and Rashad, Rashad Williams, are both 6'3", 200. They're big guys. They'll be able to hang with Ford Wheaton and pray there for sure. Can they run with them? I'm not sure, but man-to-man, uh, jams we'll see that could be the you know, those first two feet off the line of scrimmage could be a lot of fun uh, anyways they go to riley they play it's a homecoming ish for dunlap who played at nc state three seasons there chris a lot of practices in three years right yeah about a seven on seven like good on good spring whatever preseason camp whatever you want to call it um what would you make of the fact that NC State targeted their former cornerback seven times in that game? <laughs> do you do you think Gibby handed a little cheat sheet over to the offensive coordinator in NC State? I would hope so. However, what would you think that he gave up one catch for 4 yards? That's pretty darn good. That's good. Um now he's not by himself. Maybe inspired by that game. Hey, let's maybe not throw the ball at Malik Dunlap. Let's try out Rashad Williams. Well, last week Oklahoma State tried Rashad Williams. He broke up five passes last game. Now, granted, the count for Spencer Sanders, who was, I believe, below 50% in that game. Um, but they picked on him. Did it work? Did it not work? I don't know. They lost by 10 points, but 11 points, I forget. But um, teams have certainly seen something on film or suspected something and taken their chances with him. But, uh, and again, they haven't been terribly productive. They haven't gotten destroyed through the air. Again, you look at their stats, it's very average. But I think if a team wants to affect the game, they have a chance to do something like that. And, We'll we'll see what happens there. Uh, let's go to the turnover margin as we wrap up here. Is that all right? Can I? Yeah. Can I? Oh, add one more it. thing on Dunlap because yeah, you you, you piqued my interest here with that because mm-hmm. I wanted I'm curious what was on tape with Dunlap and what he does or does not do or what works against that defense because in the first three games of the year, which included that NC State game, which includes Houston, so it's not you know these aren't complete bums here. When he was targeted, he was targeted 17 times and only allowed three completions for a total of 26 yards. Mm -hmm. That is like all-American type stuff and had six pass breakups. That is all-American type cornerback. In the last three games, he's been targeted also 17 times, but teams have completed 13 passes for almost 200 yards and two touchdowns with only one pass breakup. So I'm very curious what somebody saw. I feel like somebody saw it. I just don't think you have that drop off that like you just fall off a cliff and stay at the bottom like that without somebody noticing something on tape and being like, Hey, this is how we could attack that guy. Oh uh, yeah. Williams, two catches, 56 yards. He gave up last week. So the roll the dice gambled um, Dunlap. It's a really good question. I don't know. Maybe he was good in the early part of the season. Do you think that maybe NC State, I don't know, turned something on in other teams' heads? I don't know. We'll see. But that's that's their corners. They play a lot. They may get um, Adrian Fry back this week. He's played one game. He's been there for a long, long time. Um, I think he's like their Dante Stills. But guys play corner safety. They moved about to corner this year. I thought he'd be really good. But Dunlap has been very useful for them, too. Safeties, 
good players, good tacklers. Um, have a transfer, I believe, that's been effective. I'm trying to remember his name now. I don't know. They're good. We'll see. Um, should be able to run the ball. Should be able to pass the ball if their offensive line holds up because they got a feeling they can make some plays in the secondary, especially if JT Daniels has it where he wants to have it. Uh, turnover margin is probably the stat you would start with. We'll end with it instead. Um, has been great for Texas Tech. No, it is not. 126 out of 131 at minus 1.17 per game. They have a minus seven for the season. Um, not forcing them and giving them up an awful lot. Some of that is quarterback play. A lot of it's quarterback play, I believe. Uh, Smith has a number of interceptions. They've lost some fumbles, too, but they just don't get the ball on the ground. They haven't forced a lot of fumbles. Uh, they don't get the ball out of the air. Again, the two interceptions not very good. When West Virginia is good, they're forcing turnovers, which doesn't happen very often. I get that. But, man, that was certainly the difference against Baylor. And the funny thing is, Chris, and you can look at this if you go back through the years, West Virginia's had seasons where it's been like, where are the turnovers? Where are the turnovers? Then three, four, two, three in a row. It's like this in sports, too, where something happens once that you've been working on, and it keeps happening and happening and happening. And I'll say this. like I've seen them work on these goofy drills where you you work on a, a scoop and score where the ball's in the ground, and, and, and they call this city ball, country ball, where it's a city ball. If there's a lot of people around it, it's a crowd, and you just fall on it. And it's a country ball if there's a bunch of green space around you. And you can pick it up and score. Um, I don't know how Jasir Cox diagnosed city ball, country ball, but he certainly got his hands <laughs> on a ball and returned it. Um, that was good. The blocked PAT, God, they work a ton on special teams and also the return. I wrote about how they'll flip things and they'll have defensive players play offensive drills. They'll have offensive players do defensive player drills and practice. Not to say that's why it happened. Not to say that what they were doing in August in front of us for cameras or for the first part of practice is why it worked in the sixth game and why they beat Baylor, but they do put effort into this. You can probably say that everything that they said about, well, we work on this every day. We do drills every day by and large. True. It did pay off. And now you got a taste for it a little bit, blood in the water, so to speak. Maybe they can create some more against a team that will give you the ball and will not take it back. Um, turnover margin is always important. You can run through a number of stats for a coach's tenure for the past 10 years, for as long as they've been in the big 12, for as long as Mountaineer field has been open, whatever. And if you win the turnover battle, you are far, far, far more likely to to win the game. Um, I, I just wonder about a team that goes in the road and turns it and gets a turnover margin on their side, how useful that is, especially against a team that does turn the ball over. Yeah, that's where we talked about this before the the turnover luck uh, mm -hmm. situation comes in. And you hate the word to use, use the word luck because it does involve, you know, effort uh, for the most part. But in general, you should be recovering about 50 for 50 percent of the balls that are fumbled onto the ground. Uh, and in general, you should be intercepting about 20 percent of the passes that you defend. Um, so if you are getting your hands on the ball 20 percent of the time, you should be catching it, not just tipping it away. Um, and West Virginia has been on the bad, 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 bad side of that uh the last couple of years and i don't know what you take of that uh, again some of that's effort but I, I just don't know if they've been in position for that and this against baylor obviously uh, i think as neil brown said you know they they've not had bounces go their way and they did against baylor and they capitalized and they're going to have to do it again against texas tech because um <clears throat> yeah 10 10 interceptions so far this year um rank among the worst in the country in in interceptions thrown total turnovers lost and <clears throat> and they don't often get interceptions or turnovers either so it's going to be an interesting battle to see i try to think of the last time two teams were so bad at creating turnovers but somebody's got to get them right i mean i, I can't imagine that the offenses are going to be flawless in this in this game Got like a video game glitch where there's a, a loose ball on the ground of the 15. It just it just bounces around for like <laughs> until you like smack the TV and press reset or something like that. We'll see. Uh, 13 turnovers, only 12 teams have more. 10 interceptions, only seven teams have more. Again, you throw the ball a lot, you you have a likelihood of one of the three bad things happening, right? Or what is it? Two bad things happening. You you yeah. bring that into play a little bit more too. Could be incomplete, could be intercepted, could be caught. Um, one of those three is going to happen more often if you throw it more. So, sure, that's the risk you, you invite. They've also fumbled 10 times. They've recovered 
they've only lost three, so they've recovered seven of their ten fumbles. Yeah, is that luck? I don't know, right? That's a really good number right there too. So again, ten fumbles through six games is is quite a bit for a team. There actually there are a couple of teams that have actually lost ten fumbles this year. Not surprisingly, they're bad football teams too. So ball security is something there too. Um, you circle it every game. It's probably going to be important. We'll see. Um, and finally, Chris, we'll just uh, close with something I have no desire to talk about. Wind. I'm not doing it. Not it doing might it. be windy. They might throw tortillas. Let's finish it with that. Uh, the masked rider. Don't forget. Yes. How about this? Is a woman. All so right. the mountaineer mascot. Uh oh. Are they going to duel? I at, think it'd be a. Midfield? It's a great photo op. Um. Yeah, a duel would be cool. Yeah. Like a, a Burr Hamilton. <laughs> That'd be cool. Who would win that one? We'll see. That's probably hard to, to snap out the musket and on 10 paces. We'll see. Yeah. New horse, new mascot, new coach. Uh, apparently, this has happened many times in school history. How the heck Texas Tech knew this? I don't know. Their game notes are incredible. It's um, we, we joke about these things like media guides are actually recruiting guides. Um, the recruiting aspect of the game notes, Chris, <laughs> I'll send you some stuff. It's really cool. Like stuff they do about the university, their research status, their endowments, all that stuff. Like they, they put their university front and center in this stuff. But for some reason, my eye was drawn to the fact that they have a female mass rider and it's the, like the, I don't know, like the six or seven time they've had a new coach, a new horse <laughs> and a new mascot all at once. How the heck do you know that? I was, even I was impressed by that too. So my point being we're armed with knowledge after spending a week preparing us here. We'll look ahead to the finish. 3 p.m. game. We're probably talking like 7, 7.30 maybe. Latest, I would think, on Saturday night. Uh, you'll have a Dr. Pepper cooling in the fridge, I'm sure. Yep. But before you can crack it open, we have to talk about the end of the game. Who or what affected the outcome here? We've hit on just about everything here, so you might be repetitive. That's okay. But what do you think looms large in the outcome? I mean, it has to be defensive line, right? And Dante Stills. Because I think if they do their job and exploit – the weaknesses of Texas Tech's offensive line in both the pass game and the rush game, then West Virginia is going to create havoc on the defensive side of the ball. And that's the side of the ball that I think you can safely say West Virginia is worried about, you know, and moving so far this year and moving forward. It, the, the feeling is that West Virginia's offense will be a winning offense most games. And that's not your concern. Your concern is on the defensive side of the ball. And yes, a lot of that is in the secondary, but this is this opportunity for the defensive line, the one real true strong point of this defense to make an impact and essentially cover for their weaknesses behind them. And so if they do that, West Virginia wins. We're talking about how great the defensive line played, how much havoc they created, which then in turn created more opportunities for the back end of the defense. And if West Virginia loses, we're wondering how Texas Tech, which is allowed a thousand sacks, was able to stand back there and throw with ease and pick apart a West Virginia secondary that was pretty weak. So I, I have to go with defensive line one way or the other. All right. I'm with you there. I'm going to go um, how they come out of the corners here. That bell rings. They come out. Are they are they jabbing each other? Or are they throwing haymakers? This feels like a haymaker game to me because um, – these teams might do something goofy toward the end of the game, and all of a sudden, who knows what happens. But the the first quarters for Texas Tech have been interesting. Uh, last three, touchdown, punt, touchdown. They've also given up touchdown, touchdown, touchdown the last three games. West Virginia can be very good at the start of games. Came out, got a great touchdown drive against Baylor. That's important, too. But when this settles in a little bit, both teams really do like to play their their style. And if West Virginia can get in front of the chains and, and, and in front in the scoreboard and run the ball and be even, it really kind of maximizes the, the possessions for Texas Tech. And they can be inefficient. They don't run the ball terribly well, as you mentioned. They'll turn over. They'll also take sacks and complete passes. We'll see. But Texas Tech really focuses on what they call the middle eight. Um Last four minutes of the first half, first four minutes of the second half. Get momentum, make some adjustments, come out. 41-17 to 17 scoring margin in mm-hmm. that middle eight for Texas Tech. That's important, too, because you end a half of momentum. You you either think about something to give the other team something to think about. And then you start that second half, and, and we'll see if they get the ball, who defers, who wins, anything like that. But that could be irrelevant. You can take away a strength. If you just come out and you're playing well, maybe Texas Tech doesn't have to focus on that very much. Maybe West Virginia makes them really worry about that. But can West Virginia's defense 
capitalize on some matchup advantages? Can their offense move the ball? Can they get a couple running backs involved? What will happen coming out? And then do you see something that's aggressive from the offense or the defense on either side there, too? We haven't talked about this, too, but, like, Texas Tech can be aggressive with their front. Will they challenge West Virginia's front? Will they say, hey, can you block as many guys as we're sending? We'll see. Life's been nice for JT Daniels. Can you mix it up a little bit? Can you add some chaos? We'll see. But just feel like how they come out of the corners, again, are they are they measuring each other up? Are they trying to knock each other over? I've got a feeling it could be one or the other, which may make the game interesting for the exact same reason. It could become very eventful. We'll see. Um, I just have a feeling that the start on this one here could be important, too. That, that was something I kind of thought last week. It turned out that was kind of true, but the way they finished was much more emphatic and much more important. But um, just the stats and the way things go here um, – Tech hasn't been a great first quarter team. I think about minus 12, minus 14 in the first quarter when it's not an FCS team, but of late has found some touchdowns in the first drive, but conversely has given up touchdowns too. Man, a seven point, a 10 point lead for West Virginia would be golden for them. And seven point, 10 point deficit didn't flinch last week. Might be different on the road against the team they haven't beat. We'll see. Well, three o'clock quick time. Uh, what did I say? My least favorite time for, for a kick. Yeah, it's a C minus. It's a C minus. I just uh, I need something definitive there. We'll see. Get, get half a day before, half the day after. That's no fun. Um, re- rest of the week got fresh set. First thing Saturday morning. Maybe maybe last thing Friday night. We'll see. You have three matchups, correct? Yeah, I have the three keys, three matchups out on Friday afternoon. Uh, expert picks, some recruiting news coming up. A uh, new quarterback offer. Um, somebody we said to keep an eye on. Uh, a couple months ago when West Virginia and Raheem Jeter parted ways, um, there were two quarterbacks that West Virginia was going to keep an eye on this fall and evaluate and decide whether or not they were going to offer. And late Wednesday night, as I was flying back home, Sean Boyle out of uh, Charlotte got an offer. Um, keep an eye on that one. That That is important. Uh, I, I landed in, Came home to three DMs and and multiple phone calls and a text telling me that all my phone calls are going straight to voicemail. That's I'm sorry I about that. <laughs> Thirty thousand feet up in the air at eleven o'clock at night. I uh, was not expecting a new offer to go out, but there it is. Uh, somebody to keep an eye on moving forward. Hold on one second here. Breaking. Garrett Green moved to slot receiver. There you go. Done. It's official. Publish. There you go. Well, you heard it here first. Uh, plenty more on the site today, tomorrow, up until kickoff on Saturday, and then during the game. Our normal hijinks before, during, and after. Be sure to catch it all as it unfolds. Catch up with you after the game. Rapid reaction podcast um, from our offices, not from Lubbock, Texas. Too much waiting for me. Until then, I'm Mike Casazza. And I'm Chris Anderson. Talk to you next time. <laughs>